good morning and uh, thank you for the opportunity that we've got to, uh, to be here as uh, World Mission Advisors Group. It's a very grand title for us as mission agencies. We work together um, in the world of UCCF mainly, but um, also have the privilege of coming to HTC uh, as well while we do a missions tour around the Christian Unions um, in the universities of Scotland. And um, as a group, we are about 12 agencies this year. Not all of us have been able to come, but um, we have got representation of the literature from all 12 agencies. So you'll be able to um, peruse that at the end of our time together this, uh, this morning. Um, but we are grateful to be here and we want to share with you a little bit about um, our involvement in World Mission and how you can be involved in World Mission as well. There is a great opportunity today um, to make the Lord Jesus known both locally and overseas and we want you to, to consider what God is asking of you and hopefully as we go through this morning you begin to realise that um, God can call people at different times and stages in their lives. It doesn't mean that you are thinking of perhaps mission just straight away but you may be um, called into that but you can never be too young to start an involvement and I have a real desire to see younger people, children in Sunday schools, being brought up, reading Christian mission stories and being exposed to missionaries and understanding that there is a much wider world out there than the one that perhaps they see around them. And, uh, and so we're never too young to start an interest in mission and you just don't know where that's going to lead. But let's just commit our time together today. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, we want to come and worship you this morning because you are the, Lord, the God of the whole earth. We thank you that you love the peoples of this world. You've loved us so much that you've given to us the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour, to redeem us and to bring us into your presence, that we may have a relationship with you. And Father, we would ask then that as we spend time this morning considering you and your word and considering the opportunities that there are to serve you, that you'd help us, Father, to see what it is that you would ask of us and what our response to that might be. And so, Father, we do pray that you will bless our time that we share together this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 I'll introduce us just quickly. I'm Phil uh, Steed, and I work with OMF, uh, along with my wife, who's with us this morning. She's going to be playing for us when we uh, do some worship. I've got Dave Gilchrist here from um, Wycliffe. I've got Douglas Craig from WEC. Ian Cameron from UFM. Peter Matheson. Matheson. I knew he was an M. Peter Matheson from SIM. I got Ruth Box um, from AIM. And that's the team. I've not missed anybody. No, good. That was seven of us. We travelled up together from Glasgow this morning, so um, it was an early start, and my, my mind is. A little bit somewhere between here and on the A9. Anyway, we're going to start by singing some worship songs to the Lord, and we're going to start with My Jesus, My Saviour, Lord, there is none like you, and wherever we go around the world, there is none who compares to our Saviour Jesus. Let's worship together. <laughs>
end our worship as we sing the splendor of the King. <laughs>
good to welcome those on the video link this morning as well and it's nice to see you on the screen and uh, glad you could make it uh, uh, to join in this morning with us. We want to um, share a little bit about our agencies and tell you a little bit of where we work and what we do. So I'm going to ask Douglas and Ian to come to the front just now. If you come on this side then people will see you on the camera as well. And um, just tell us, um, Douglas, a little bit about WEC. What, why does WEC exist? What is, what is it that makes WEC tick? Well, WEC ticks um, because of God's heart for the world. I think that's, and that's a motivation for all mission <coughs> agencies and all churches and all Christians, I'm sure. But WEC has a specific um, focus on reaching the remaining unreached peoples of the world. That was CT study <coughs> vision when we went to Africa over 100 years ago and that's still been the main focus of the mission. Okay, so it's mainly based in Africa? No, no, we're now uh, on all continents and uh, not in Antarctica, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> Most of that's that's of that's <laughs> that's <laughs> Over 60 countries of the world <laughs> and um, increasingly there's a, 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 most of our growth or uh, our growth area has been among the countries where it's you can't go in as a conventional missionary, uh, creative access nations, where the, the hardest to reach are actually, and also the most challenging circumstances. But <coughs> so that's been, we work in more, uh, over 60 countries. Okay, right. Ian, UFM, um, what does that stand for? Um, um, yes, well, that's a good question. What does yeah. UFM stand for? It stood for uh, Unevangelized Fields Mission. Um, and it grew out of WEC actually from uh, 1931, historically we were part of WEC and then it, it was a breakaway, I don't know what all the reasons were for that, but, uh, historically. It's nice to see you standing together. <laughs> <laughs> United we stand. All, all, all one in Christ Jesus. Um, but actually, Unevangelized Fields Mission has been seen as a bit of a, an old-fashioned uh, title and we're in the process of moving it towards being known as United for Mission, which sounds mm, a bit more nice. up-to-date and uh, right. uh, easier to, to understand for folk. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so is it again focusing in on the unreached peoples? Unreached people, yeah. Mm -hmm. And traditionally, we were we had missionaries in Brazil, in what was then the Belgian <coughs> Congo in Africa and Papua New Guinea, but we now have missionaries in about forty countries all around the world. And actually, over half of our UFM missionaries are serving in Europe, about fifty-three percent, which mm -hmm. has shown a bit of a shift. And quite mm -hmm. a few in this country as well, reaching ethnic minority groups uh, within the UK. Yeah. Okay. Right, so coming to um, some short-term opportunities, is there anything in particular that um, comes to mind that you would want to plug for anybody here? Because you don't have to be a student, you could be a lecturer. <laughs> <laughs> Douglas? Well, WEC has um, a short-term programme called WEC Trek, and this summer we've got three teams going, one to Indonesia uh, to work uh, with schools and with children. It's quite an exciting opportunity because uh, in Indonesia, as you know, there's a large Muslim population and a, a substantial Christian population and the Christian schools are popular with the Muslims. So this team is going out to um, teach and do a week's Bible teaching in one of the schools and also working with un underprivileged children. So that's to Indonesia. The other one's to Taiwan. There's a church planting team in Taiwan among the Hakka tribal group. and. Um, there's a Korean couple working there and the team would go out and help them. And the third short term or mission team this summer is to Mexico and uh, work as a centre there and works with the local churches too. So there are three mission, three teams going out and as well as that we can organise individual placements for uh, up to a year under the short term programme anywhere in the world. <laughs> well, <at> almost. <laughs> North Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> North Antarctica. <laughs> yeah, yeah, about just just following on from what Douglas has said, we would offer uh, placements for folk who are studying theology as well, or uh, any of the students really to, to go and work alongside our missionaries in, in different uh, roles that they're involved in. Um, for summer teams this year, we've got a summer team going out to Brittany that I'm going to be heading up. For that, you need to be a, a French speaker. So if any of you can speak French and you'd like uh, two weeks in uh, Brittany, serving <coughs> alongside the local church there, then... Um, I you know, would be delighted to hear from you. Um, we have other teams, a team going to Hungary, you don't have to speak Hungarian for that, <laughs> thankfully. And um, teams going to, to Thailand and to South Africa, just to name a few uh, different uh, summer teams. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, you can take your seats. Um, all these will be um, featured at the back on the, the boards that we have there. 
And if those who are videoing in want any further information, please just um, get in touch and we'll tell you how to do that later on and we can get the information to you as well. But we're going to watch a video clip now of, uh, entitled Men in Mission. And one of the questions is, where are all the men? Because the mission fields today are populated by many, many women and very few men. And Sandra MacDonald is saying amen to women. <laughs> amen. <laughs> no, more than amen. We won't go to one, you know. But um, <laughs> one is a start. And here is somebody's um, story of how they ended up in mission. My name is Steve, and I'm from Nottingham, and I'm currently in Kaur, in the north of Kenya, in the middle of nowhere. So I, I came from teaching for a, a number of years in England, in a primary school. So coming here to a primary school, it seems like doing the same thing, but... I didn't grow up dreaming of coming to Africa at all. I, I dreamed of playing for Manchester United. <laughs> ah, some of the children here have the same dream. For about a year, I wrestled against that, but slowly, God was, I, I feel God was loosening the roots in my life that I'd placed, <coughs> and then more people were coming and saying, you should go to Africa. So young men who are thinking about going to the mission fields, one thing I would say is we need you. I didn't realize before I came out what an embarrassment in some ways it is. Where are the men? And there will be men who at the moment God is dealing with and moving in that, that, that direction. There'll be perhaps a sense of restlessness that my dreams are too small. Is this, is this all I'm doing? Is this it? And it, so often that is, that is God set, pushing us and saying, no, there's more, there's more and there are people that can only be reached out here by men. Sometimes to disciple these young men, these, these school children, who are without a father, and then they see maybe you, a young man coming from whatever part of the world to serve God's purposes here. You go through life thinking, I'll do what I do and that's fine, and there's a, there's a continent crying out for maybe somebody like you. It's interesting to, to see how when he got there, he saw how embarrassing it was to the, the lack of men on the mission field and realised that a lot of the work was being done by, by women. And uh, as a man who never wants to be outdone by women, you know, I have a passion to find the men who want to go and um, help the teams that are on the mission field today. Um, men of mission, are we really involved? Are we really willing to consider, is this something that God wants me to be involved in? Um, it was John Piper said, there are two types of people, um, the obedient and the disobedient. Those who obey God's call and are involved in some shape, way or form are those who totally ignore God's call on, on their lives. And it doesn't mean that you have to go, but you, you need to be praying, you need to be supporting, you need to be um, helping um, those who do go if you're not the ones to go. But there's no excuse, he says, you're either obedient or disobedient when it comes to world mission. And, and that's a challenge to all of us as to what is it that God is asking me um, to do. And perhaps we're only brave enough to say, I'm willing to listen, God, if it's to be a support and a help and an encouragement and a prayer warrior, rather than to be the one who actually goes and, and experiences it firsthand. 
we've got somebody on our video link, Andrew, who um, has been in Rwanda for three and a half weeks mm -hmm. as a short-term folks. No, Rwanda. What did I say? No, you're right. Rwanda. Yeah. It, right. You're right. He's not in the video link, though. Oh. Apparently not. Has he Andrew, gone? are you there? Are you there, Andrew? He was going to come in. Yeah, but he's not. He's not there. Oh, That's a shame. He was going to tell us how important it is to spend some of our time short term overseas. Um, do you know, the world is so small today that you can actually um, go relatively easily to most of the places around the world. And if you are a Christian and you have never experienced God working in another culture or another situation, I would heartily recommend that you do that. My first experience was going to Nigeria. Um, to teach missionaries' children on a summer camp that the, the school that they attended had sent them out to. And Kath and I, we'd be married a year, and we went um, to visit uh, missionaries from my home church who had never been visited from anybody back home ever in the whole of their mission career. And so we wrote and said, if we come, we'd have to do something. We don't want you just to be glorified tourists in Nigeria. We want to come to be helpful. She said, buy you plane tickets, we'll find you plenty to do, don't you worry. <laughs> so they sent us to run this camp for the Mish kids. Um, and uh, they were in a school where 50% of the, the pupils were nationals. So they were all encouraged to bring a national friend with them to the camp um, so that it was going to be an evangelistic camp. When we got there, there were no nationals. There mm -hmm. were only the children of missionaries who were at the camp. They didn't have any relationships with the children in the school that they were sitting in class with, apart from within their own circle of friends. And so we threw our evangelistic Bible studies out, and we talked about the fact that God places us where he places us, not just um, in families, but in countries too. And they weren't there by default, they were there by design, that God wanted them as part of the team that he had growing up in Nigeria. And we had a super week helping these children to think through what their involvement with their classmates should be, rather than just their involvement with one another was. Mm -hmm. And um, trying to get them to, to understand what the meaning of prayer was, to pray for the work that their parents were involved in. There was um, a swimming pool at the campsite that we'd gone to, and one of the girls hit her head on the bottom in a game of water polo, and had to be lifted out on a board, and put on the back of a truck and sent back to the town four hours drive away. Um, and that was on day two of our time. Um, so we immediately vacated the pool, got the children together in the meeting room and said, you're going to have to pray because this girl had no feeling in her arms or her legs. She was just on a board and she was taken away. And for the first time, apart from saying their set prayers with their parents, they really cried out to God and asked him to help. And by the time we got back to um, uh, the, the compound where, where they were all based at the end of the week, she started to feel sensation in her fingers and her toes. And by the end of our three weeks, she walked across the car park to say goodbye to us. Mm. That was a super short-term trip for me and Kath. Because we learned so much about what it means to be in a different culture, in a different context, but also seeing how God could use just that short time just to help these children in a way that perhaps the parents weren't able to get through to them. And through that one incident, their lives were transformed as they saw God working in a powerful way. Would you want to miss that opportunity? No, I wouldn't have wanted to have missed that opportunity. Wouldn't wanted that girl to go through that situation again. But God used that situation and that time that we had to go and give just a short-term opportunity to one particular area. Are you prepared to, to take time out and to do something like that? Because it will change the way you pray for mission, even if you never go back long term as a missionary. It will change the way that you do um, engage with what God is doing elsewhere. You will pray for missionaries in a way that you've never been able to pray before because you've experienced what it's like alongside them. And you've seen how hard it is just to get water out of a tap and then filter it and then prepare it ready for drinking. The mundane things. That, that missionaries go through in some parts of the world just to survive without doing what they've actually been gone to do. And so I would challenge every one of us, if we haven't had the opportunity to go and see what God is doing elsewhere, to take that opportunity up and just go and see and, and find out a little bit more of what the great God is that we are serving today and what he is doing in different contexts and cultures. 
because it will also uh, whet our appetite to say, God, hear as well, please. One of the big questions that churches are facing today and asking, <coughs> what is our future? Well, our future is in God's hands. And if we want to know what God is able to do, go and have a look to see what he is doing in other places. And that will encourage us to pray with faith into the situations that he's placed us in, in the UK as well. The other thing that we've been encouraged with as mission agencies over the years are those who are training for ministry but wanting to have a cross-cultural opportunity as part of their preparation for going into full-time Christian ministry here in the UK. Because if they're going to be preaching and teaching about the whole counsel of God, then when somebody comes forward and asks, what about overseas work and what, what should I do in terms of understanding what God is asking of me? To have had some short-term experience themselves equips them far greater than any textbook that they could study and read. And so then again, if we're preparing for ministry in the UK, then it's a really good opportunity as part of that training to take time out to do some kind of overseas mission so that you are thoroughly equipped in all aspects of church ministry and life. So just think about those things as we go on into the, um, into the, the program this morning. I'm going to ask Peter and Ruth to come forward. Peter's with SIM. Yeah, it I was know. the Sudan Interior Mission when I was a boy, but it's no longer that. That's right. So tell us about SIM. Yeah, well, with moving also into Southeast Asia and South America, the name didn't really work in the last. Like, you know, didn't really like being called the Sudan Interior Mission. So, <laughs> uh, it's a big general mission, does a lot of things in a lot of different places. The beating heart of it is that we want to be doing things that give us opportunity to share the gospel. The people living and dying without hearing about Jesus, that is our focus. And if that means education or boreholes or theological education, changes all over the world. But that's the that's heart of what drives us. Okay. And Ruth, AIM, is it still only in Africa? It's, well, yes and no. It's <laughs> <laughs> See, the world of yes. mission gets more interesting by the day. <laughs> yes, our focus is Africa but we're increasingly reaching out to diaspora African people groups that are in other parts of the world. So we have outreaches in Canada, in Bristol, in the south of France, uh, and increasingly looking to develop more UK outreaches, training local church volunteers mm -hmm. to uh, reach out to Africans and to the wider Muslim community within the UK and you know, in the rest of Europe as well. Okay. So Pete, did you always think that you're going to end up in mission? I suppose so. I think so. It was an early ambition. I had more, more of a wanderlust and adventures kind of spirit. And my first invitation to go on a short term team was to Ethiopia. No brainer. Yeah. <laughs> I'll go to Ethiopia. What are we doing? <laughs> you know, uh, but yeah, there was always that kind of desire to go. Okay. So where did that desire come from, do you think? I, 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 th I think it's part of who I am, the way God wired me to want to explore and travel and see new things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that was that would only be well, it would be very useful. Uh, and it's kind of redeemed that part of me, and, and it's given me a desire to to think bigger than than just uh, my own experiences. But mm -hmm. it's brought me to this role to, yeah. to to be at a big level and be able to see lots of people doing lots of great things, much better than I could. Uh, okay. You know. Right. And Ruth, what about you? Was it mission always, or pretty much uh, that was what was in my head, but. Uh, the way it has panned out has been a slightly unexpected journey because I remember when I became a Christian when I was six and I remember when I was about eight sitting in church when some old bloke who was probably about 30 <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know when you're eight everybody's old and you know this guy stood up and doing the children's talk and was saying now children what do you want to be when you grow up and because I lived in a farming community it was all I want to be a farmer or a vet or a nurse or a da -da -da -da, all these kind of things and I remember sticking my hand up and saying I want to be a missionary and all the wee wifeys in church all went oh <laughs> and I'm like <laughs> but from then that was what stuck with me was mm -hmm. that I wanted to be a missionary so I had said to God um, when I was going through the end of school I said if you want me to go to university I'll go to university if you want me to get a job give me a job. I got the first job I applied for and I spent the next 13 years working in a bank. And you know that was not the mission field that I had imagined, but it was a mission field nonetheless. And you know, my every branch that I moved to, 
the challenge on kind of day one was to pick cards on the table, you know, I'm a Christian, I do this. And because I was so involved in Christian music, it was very easy to do. Mm -hmm. And um, that also gave me the opportunity to do short term stuff in the summer. So I did six short term summer mission teams to France. I have a funny feeling to the same place that you might be going mm -hmm. later yeah. on this year. Um, so I'm thinking, oh, could I go? <laughs> but uh, from then on, God moved me from role to role in his time. And the skills that were in the one role were the skills that helped in the next role. Uh, and I've worked with Youth for Christ, Mission Aviation Fellowship, um, a local church setting, and I'm now with Africa Inland Mission. So it's been great to see how the, the roles, each role has built on the one before. And I think that's mm -hmm. one thing I would say is that you know, if you're obedient to where God has you for now, that experience and equipping, and mm -hmm. even sometimes the traumas, mm -hmm. will be useful in the next thing that he's got for you, as well as being helpful or helpful or horrible, no matter what it mm -hmm. is now, it will be of use in God's plan in the future. Yeah, I think that's an important um, message to get across. The time spent waiting for God to take you to the place that he's got in store next is never time wasted mm -hmm. because he's preparing and, and giving you experiences that you'll draw on in, in future ministry as well. And so don't always be looking for the next opportunity, but be 100% where God's got you now, but also open to what God's got in store in the future too, and being willing to give up what you've got now when God says now it's time for the next chapter. Um, but don't always be sitting there thinking, oh, if only I could be somewhere else, mm -hmm. because where you are now is where God's got you for now. And, and it's important to give you all where you're at, but also being willing to say, well, Lord, if you are going to lead me on into the next role, then give me a willing heart to do that and be brave enough to do it. What about some summer opportunities that you may have available? Uh, not much this summer. Uh, we're, at the moment we're focusing more on graduate age and internship scheme that we have to take um, people from all different professions and give them an internship into missions and long-term exposure that would run over the course of one year or two years, which includes a kind of heavy uh, pre-field training, a month's residential training that we do in the UK. So aiming for you know graduate age uh, mm -hmm. individuals. Okay. So if you're looking for a gap year, having enjoyed your student life and not ready for the real world out there, <laughs> <laughs> an internship with SIM yeah, could yeah. be on the cards. Okay. Ruth? Um, AIM does a two-year missionary training programme called TIMO that some of you might have heard of. Um, SIM work with us in that as well sometimes. but. Um, it's a two-year missionary training program that teaches you how to be a missionary by taking you to an unreached people group and being a missionary in that unreached people group. And this summer we actually have five short-term teams going out to various Timo team locations in Madagascar, on an Indian Ocean island, mm -hmm. in Kenya, <laughs> you know, lot, lot, five different places and those are the kind of highlights. And the, these month-long teams will be shadowing existing Timo teams. So primarily for those who are thinking, hmm, might Timo be something for me? But two mm -hmm. years is an awful long time to commit on the off chance. You know, if I'm not quite sure that God's leading me there. So if, mm -hmm. if, you th if people are thinking that that might be an option for them and they want to go and have a look, then these what we call Timo Quest teams might be mm -hmm. a, a way forward for them. And you know some very nice locations as well across <laughs> Africa. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, you can both sit down. We're going to take time to look at another video clip and just to put the balance right and the gender um, indifference, we're going to have a girl talk to us um, about her involvement in mission. So growing up, I... We're not going to come up here for some reason. It's not coming up there for some reason. <coughs> um, oh, a minute, this is something else that's open. Why is that coming through? Okay, I'll take one, I'll just kill that just now. You can put that up again and see if this comes up this time. Just put it down there. No, I don't mind that, it's not first. I loved to read, and I especially loved the books by Laura Ingalls Wilder about her life. Her life growing up in the pioneer times. 
Yes, that's me. I'm sorry about this, folks. So, growing up... Growing up, I loved to read, and I especially loved the books by Laura Ingalls Wilder about her life growing up in the pioneer times in the West, and I really wanted to be a pioneer woman when I grew up, but living in the suburbs of California it was implausible, so I sort of gave up on that. And I grew up, I became an engineer, and I moved to Portland, Oregon, where I got a job and found a church that I just loved and settled in. I love Portland, and I, I love living there. And I thought I was settled, but God had other plans. I started taking a course called Perspectives on the World Christian Movement, which totally captured my imagination and just changed my worldview. Even though I'd grown up in a Christian home and have many missionary relatives, I never really understood that we we're blessed in order to be a blessing and that God desires for every Christian to go and aid in his work of bringing the good news to all the nations. I got so excited and I got really involved in the course. I was teaching the course and helping other people see this vision. And I started looking at opportunities for volunteering overseas. I looked at some engineering work and some relief work and that really connected with me on the blessed in order to be a blessing level. But I realized that it was missing that element of bringing God's good news to those who had never heard it. So I then remembered this little brochure that I saw once from Wycliffe that says, fight poverty with linguistics. And I realized that that was perfect. Wycliffe seeks to bring the Bible to people who don't have it in their own language. And the literacy work that Wycliffe does helps people improve their lives. So I just knew that this was what I was supposed to do. I had never heard God speak so clearly to me before. He was saying, go and go now. But I said, God, this isn't exactly a good time. What are you doing here? But he was insistent, so I obeyed, and it was amazing to see how he just moved every single obstacle. But, you know, I applied to Wycliffe in March, and by June, I had sold most of my possessions, quit my job, and moved to Canada to study linguistics for two semesters. I just got done with that, and I'm starting on my partnership development. And as soon as I finish, I will be going to South Asia to do language assessment. And the information that we gather will add to the academic community as well as help with them to make strategic decisions about where to use their resources best and how they can best help people get the Bible in their own language as well as have literacy programs and things of that nature. So I'm, it's just exciting to see how God has used all of the skills and experiences that he's given me to be part of this exciting time of accelerating Bible translation for everyone. I, my experience with engineering has given me technical skills that will help with survey. Um, my love of reading, of course, is connected with linguistics, and even a seemingly unrealistic dream of being a pioneer woman is all part of it. So it's cool to see how God has blessed us in order to bless other people, and I'm just humbled to be part of his plan. Thank you, David. Sorry about the um, the video link didn't the video actually didn't show, but the audio worked. So Sorry. hopefully we've um, we've got the gist of what uh, she was saying. Um, having felt she was settled, God had other plans, and she was one who who thought she was where God wanted her until He stepped in and opened up a whole new way for her to be involved in mission. I've just had a word in my ear to say that Kara in Dundee has had a short term experience. Is that right, Kara? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> You're looking very excited there about that. Would you like to tell us where you went and for how long? You might need to put your volume up. Yeah, um, I went to Indonesia for, um, it was supposed to be two months, and I ended up staying nearly four. And then I went back again a couple of years ago for three months. Okay, so who was that with? And so it was through a personal link with, with a, a worker there that um, encouraged you to go out and, and experience that. So how come you stayed for so long? I didn't have anything to do. I 
thing to do and they were short of hands, so I just stayed in that's, that's as good a reason as any. <laughs> yeah. Would you recommend short term to others? Um, if you're thinking about going long term, it's worth doing. But um, I've met a lot of people that are just going because it's the equivalent of a holiday for them. So I'm kind of like worry about recommending it too highly. That is a really good point, Cara, because um, we get lots of people who come to us and say, well, I did um, Africa and I've done Latin America, so I'm thinking now maybe OMF Southeast Asia, that sounds great. And I say, Thomas Cook do really good package holidays. <laughs> you know, because if you haven't really got a heart for what God's doing and you're just trying to tick off the continents, well, go with a holiday agency, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but that's a really good point to make and um, thanks for sharing that because I, th I think um, there are many people who treat missions just as holiday options which are perhaps a little bit more safe because they're going to be put into somebody's care when they're there um, but they get to see the world on the back of what the missionaries are doing but they're not really partnering. So thanks for that Cara and um, that's really helpful and I'm glad we... Um, I'm glad I had a word in my ear to say, talk to Cara in Dundee about her trip to Indonesia. <laughs> and Indonesia, excellent place to go too. David, come to the front right. and um, yeah, go that side so they can see your lovely face. Yeah. David, you are with Wycliffe. Mm -hmm. So yeah. for those who are not aware what Wycliffe specialises in, what do you specialise in? Yeah, that, that's this, there is a slight difference perhaps between some of the other agencies in Wycliffe because Wycliffe is a very focused ministry. Whilst we're all concerned with building God's kingdom up throughout the earth and all the rest of it, um, and we're all sort of using people with different skills. Wycliffe has a definite focus, uh, and the beating heart of Wycliffe is that we want to see people get the scriptures in the language that they best understand. So the majority of our, our stuff would be to do with language, you know, language development, literacy work, that sort of thing, and obviously uh, Bible translation, and then going on and using the Bible scripture use, that sort of side of thing, as opposed to, uh, you know, sort of evangelism or church planting or whatever, we would leave that to other people to get on with. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't exclude people who are willing to work on the support team. <coughs> oh, indeed not. Um, to be quite honest with you, um, if you look at the statistics within Wycliffe, um, people are involved in language-related roles, whether it's you know translation or literacy work, uh, language development. It's just the tip of the iceberg. You probably need about nine people below that one person to support them. Um, so, yeah, like all the other agencies, we need guys with IT skills, I, business, finance, admin, you know, the usual sort of thing uh, to support and enable these people to stay out in the field and do so that, you know, is a, a very valid ministry for anybody, all these other things. It's not just the, the translation work. Okay. It's valid. And what brought you into mission? Yeah, well, it's a sort of circuitous route. I wasn't like Ruth, I didn't have this sort of uh, vision from, from day one or whatever. Um, I've spent quite a bit of time doing various things, uh, when you get to my age you've had the opportunity to do that, you know. Uh, I've studied different things, and I've been in business uh, and different things, so I went off to uh, Bible college at one point thinking that God was wanted me to prepare myself, sort of, you know, study-wise, theologically, uh, for something. At that time I actually thought it was the pastoral ministry, but I guess I probably got it wrong because I've ended up in mission, but hey, that's okay. Uh, as I went through Bible college, um, I hedged my bets a wee bit, I did a lot of pastoral sort of stuff and I, I did a lot of mission stuff so that exposed me to missions which was really good uh, and hence that probably led me down this route. But you know the, the pastoral stuff has been very beneficial as well, uh, learning that at the same time. But if you want to know what the specifics of what led me into mission, um, it was probably due to, I can sort of think of the one guy, the one guy that really sort of encouraged me and uh, yeah. yeah. You going to name him? Um, but they won't be named. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, he, was, he was a personal friend and he actually okay. worked for Wycliffe as well. Um, right. so. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So what opportunities do Wycliffe have? Well, as I say, you know, like any agency here, you know, whatever skill you've got, I guess we could use it, to be quite honest with you. Um, but if you're thinking about opportunity-wise, you know, how, what's the entry way into Wycliffe or whatever, we do some short-term summer stuff. Uh, not as much as other people. We do a two-week thing in France, in the in this in the summer. And that's really um, for you to explore a wee bit more. It's not a, a short-term summer mission as such, per se. 
It's for you to explore uh, Wycliffe to find out more about that and also to find out you know, more about yourself and whether you're a fit for Wycliffe. So it's a bilingual camp and you do a bit of Bible study, you do a bit of cross-cultural stuff, etc. And you actually do a small project that's used uh, somewhere after that. So there is something practical comes out of it. So there's that. Um, the other way that the majority of people would come into Wycliffe would be a sort of internship type thing. You know, you do um, three months study at Redcliffe Bible College where you do cross-cultural stuff, some language stuff get prepared before you go out onto an initial ass assignment for a year or two years, which is similar sort of thing to what we just talking about, the two year type thing or whatever. <coughs> um, so there's these different ways in. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, David. Okay, um, well that just leaves myself um, and OMF, um, Overseas Missionary Fellowship, that was once the China Inland Mission. We celebrate 150 years anniversary this year. Um, since Hudson Taylor founded the CIM. Um, we just stand for OMF now. Um, it doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, difficult to go into creative access nations where missionaries are not welcome with an organization called the Overseas Missionary Fellowship. Um, so we just dropped the words and kept the initials. And in many of the Asian contexts, that's just fine. They don't have to mean anything. It's just OMF, so that's okay. Um, you, can, you can be just that. So we are OMF International. So we don't stand for anything, but we stand for the Lord, um, and that's important. Um, we, we work amongst the Asian communities, and we have uh, also developed a diaspora ministry uh, across many parts of um, uh, the, the Southern and the Western Hemisphere, and also the African Church have asked OMF to go and help them to reach the million Chinese that they've got in Africa who have come over as a workforce. And so that's a new development for, for OMF to to be going in the opposite direction, um, going to, to Africa to help the church there and reach the diaspora Chinese especially. Um, you'll be familiar with Sandra who's on our Thai, you're the only Thai, full-time diaspora Thai worker in the whole of OMF. Hmm. You've got a, such a privilege here in HTC, <laughs> you know, she's one of a kind but you didn't need me to tell you that. And, um, so, so we've got many opportunities to reach Asians outside of Thailand and, and Asia as well uh, and preparing them to go back. That's our focus, is to prepare them to go back, to take the gospel with them and to reach the people that they will have contact with where perhaps there are no workers and there are no opportunities as yet for the gospel to go into their communities. So the focus isn't just reaching them here, but to reach them, to prepare them and help them to think about taking the message back with them when they go back home. Well, it's good to talk about mission, but it's also good to look at God's word and what he says about it. And so I'm going to ask Pete to come up and he's going to take us to the scriptures now. We'll see where this goes, yeah. I'll sit, I'll sit up, yeah. I'll just give it I love the I love the team aspect of getting to do this as different agencies together. Especially when you have someone like to do the laptop. Well, I, will I just give this a wee. Yeah, just give it a go and see if it works. See if it's responding. It's not. Well, it's it's just, it's it doesn't. It doesn't. Is it? It's on the power inside. I don't know. I just picked it up from here. It's buzzing. It's making a funny noise. It's buzzing. <laughs> So, uh, I'll just go. <laughs> it's been a long, it's a long gig for you, David. You, you've done really well. Uh, oh, don't worry. That's okay. Don't worry. Just give it. Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, so this is a Toyota Land Cruiser 4x4. It's got uh, great big tyres, two massive fuel tanks. It's got a winch, uh, all of which I've used in the snorkel. It was my first love. I met, I met my wife about a fortnight afterwards. <laughs> this was love at first sight. We took some conversations before we got to that stage. Uh, I met my wife out in South Sudan. This is actually in Sudan, North Sudan these days. Um, on a short term trip, we went to a people group called the Ganza people and started to learn a bit of their language and their culture. Initial studies just to see how we would open up a ministry with them, who's in charge, what language do they speak, how many of them are there, how many centres of population. They lived in the bush, they're very, very rural, uh, underdeveloped uh, as far as our idea of development goes. Uh, yeah, and we, we, we worked away hard and we, we, we wanted in our eagerness in that two years to be able to share the gospel with them. If you go to the next one, uh, they have a, they have a, 
animist uh, belief system. Uh, the, we would tell them the Bible stories uh, that, that we thought would help them to understand something of God's nature, of Jesus. We, we, we tried to go through chronologically. Uh, we got very little response. We'd end up with unveiling Jesus as, as we thought he should be described and we'll just be met with this expression. <laughs> this is delays over. That's great. <laughs> nice story. Thanks. Uh, it was really frustrating. Uh, it wasn't until we started hearing what they had to say and what they thought and what their beliefs were that we started to piece things together that may have been obvious to someone that was better trained than us. They're from a, a culture that thinks in terms of shame, uh, not in terms of judgment. There was a rape in the village when we were there, and the, the, the way they dealt with it is they stood the guy up, they all stood around him and they said, he raped that girl. And that was it. Everyone went home. There was no imprisonment, there was no beating, there was nothing. It was just an identification. You are shamed now for the rest of your life. And that, that's what they saw that we didn't get. How do you explain the Ten Commandments without a concept of law and justice? You know, we've gone about it all wrong. Uh, you can go to the next one. So we told some Bible stories uh, uh, and it didn't go so well, so we thought, well, a different approach. Uh, when there's a drought, they kill a chicken, they take it to the holy man, and he puts the blood over a stone on the ground. He washes it and then covers it with oil, and then the rain's meant to come. And we, t we talked about how our lives are devoid of life. Uh, we have a drought spiritually in our life. Now we need a sacrifice to, to make that right. Is the blood of a chicken enough to fix all the, the rape and murder and the theft in the world? No. What about a cow? Oh, that's a lot of money. What about a man? What about God's son? And wouldn't another sacrifice now be an insult to God if you were saying that his son wasn't enough? And we went along these lines and, and we talked about how the water is actually the washing away of sin, uh, baptism, and the pouring of the oil, the sealing of the Holy Spirit. And the penny started to drop. And it was wonderful. And it was like people were engaging. This is the kind of face we were seeing now. Ah. People would get angry, they'd get cross, they'd take their kids and they'd storm off shouting. Others would start to cry and we'd ne we never saw any, any men cry the whole time we were there, except when we started touching on this kind of thing. It was profound and it was like in 1 Corinthians, the aroma of death to death and of life to life. There was a polarisation that happened with this presentation. Uh, and then, so the next one, and from that a church is kind of born and this is, this is their, their, their pastor, Bacodi. Now we can't get back to these people, the war has cut them off. They, they have visits from other churches, from tribes in the area that can go in unseen like we can't. And, and the work there continues to grow. Uh, why do I share this? Just to promote short-term missions. I was, we were graduate engineering students with no linguistics training, no uh, formal theological training. Uh, the opportunities are just there for people to go, listen to God, open his word, uh, and build relationships. Uh, and it's amazing what, what God does. That, that's kind of where my wife, wife and I met and that's what we want our life to be around. And we're here on a journey towards doing that with permanence somewhere. Uh, the, the, the one thing that brought us away from that situation into this role uh, is the privilege of being a voice among a generation uh, of, our, of our age group, also you know, everyone here I think. It's a really profound responsibility on us, uh, and it's a privilege. Uh, and Luke chapter 12 is the bit of the Bible we were studying when this, this opportunity came up as mobilizers. Uh, from everyone who's been given much, much will be demanded. From the one who has been trusted with much, much more will be asked. This is from the story in, in Luke about the servant that's left by the master to do his master's business. If he comes back and everything's going fine, he's prioritized his master's business, he will be blessed. Uh, however, if he if he takes advantage of his master's absence, has a party, beats up the other off the other servants, he's in trouble. <laughs> he's dealt with. He gets he gets severely beaten, my yeah, uh, chopped up in some translations. He, he meets a grisly end. Um, <laughs> we are that person. We are the one to whom much has been entrusted. Uh, and the whole of our church's history and geography, I believe that we are the most materi materially prospered and best equipped for meeting the challenge of the Great Commission. 
Uh, so some examples of this, if you want to click, this is a fun slide now. Yeah. So the obvious one, yeah, money. There, there's lots of it around. We have such a thing as a disposable income. <laughs> uh, next, we'll just go through these quickly. Yeah. We can yeah. travel. Uh, next one, uh, yeah, cost of flying is, we can go away. We don't have to go on a ship for the rest of our life. We can come back for weddings and funerals and everything else. We can go vaccinated against things that killed missionaries in the past with anti-malarials, all these kind of things. We have, a, we have a foreign office behind us that will come and get us out of trouble if we get stuck. Do you want to hit the next one? Yeah. Yay. <laughs> uh, thank God for that. Not everyone's got that. If we, if we won't get lost in the bush somewhere. Thank you, Philip Hammond, William Hague, or whoever it is. No. Uh, uh, that's, that's not always been the case in missions from our culture. Certainly not around the world. Next one. Uh, they make, we make it education. Now, I am fairly intelligent. I, I went to a decent school. I got decent grades. So I went to a decent university. I did a decent amount of work and I got a decent qualification without ever actually having to think ambitiously about my education. We're so privileged in the education and the access that gives us around the world. Not least our access to, to ongoing, lear ongoing learning. Like the next one, we can, we can turn up in a country to share the gospel and learn our language before we even get there, we can learn it on iTunes. Uh, next one, you can do it on your on your bus journey before you even get there. That's a that's something we've been entrusted with our, our availability of information. Next one, uh, you guys know this better than anyone. We've got the, anything that was ever significant written down about the Bible is three or four clicks away on our phone. You know, we we have got access to a wealth of of experience. Uh, next one. Uh, this guy here, I'm not. Uh, I guess John Gibson Payton. He's my favourite. Uh, we've got the example of those that have gone before us. Next one. For everyone who's been given much, much will be demanded, and from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. This is what drives us. Uh, we are the best equipped, best resourced generation in the history and geography of the church for meeting the challenge. The logistical challenges of overseas mission, and that's that's quite a profound challenge, I think. Um, just to talk a bit about John Gibson Payson, uh, I'll go to the next one. He was a missionary to the New Hebrides, which is an island cluster off Papua New Guinea, in the South Pacific. Do you know the story? Mm -hmm. Who's heard of John Gibson Payson? There's some really quotable lines. You hear him talked about quite a lot. Anyway, he, he's from Scotland, he worked at the Glasgow City Mission and he was an associate a trainee pastor in Maryhill before he went out to the New Hebrides. He, you can go back one, just a minute. Uh, the, the, the missionaries that were on the island before him were killed and eaten in sight of the boat that dropped them off as it, as it retreated back across the horizon. The next missionaries to turn up on that island, knowing what they were getting into, was uh, John Payton and his family. Uh, he had a thriving ministry in, in Glasgow, and the church leadership there, you can go next one to the text, didn't want him to go. One of his elders told him, uh, son, it would be a waste of all your potential, all that God's doing for you to go and take your family. You'll surely die, you'll be eaten by cannibals, you'll have your head chopped off in an ISIS video on YouTube. There's absolutely no sense in you doing this. Look what God's doing with you now. He says, Mr. Dixon, you're advanced in years now. And your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave, there to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honouring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I am eaten by cannibals or by worms. <laughs> <laughs> and that was Mr. Dixon Tell. <laughs> and off he went. And he didn't die, he wasn't eaten by cannibals. He did encounter a huge human loss. He, he lost his first wife and I think two of his kids died in infancy, so he knew suffering. These days Vanuatu is what used to be the New Hebrides. Uh, in spite of all that loss, he ends his autobiography with the following words in the next slide. Jesus has taken possession, never again to quit these shores. Glory, glory to his blessed name. He considered it a job well done. Uh, that's from Operation World, your percentage of Christians now in Vanuatu. <coughs> These days, uh, they, they had a, a state rededication of their nation to God at the millennium, that kind of thing, you know. Mm. That's the, t today's Pakistan was, was then Vanuatu. He left a thriving 
God blessed prospered ministry in Glasgow. Uh, he, he didn't have to go. It's, 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 I was looking through it for a sense of calling, for, for, for the, the divine instruction, the opening in the clouds, when God says, I want you to go to the heavens, and I couldn't find it. I find that really weird in his autobiography, because we think a lot in, along these terms. One other person that I think he's quite similar to uh, would be would be Stephen. So if you could turn with me to Acts chapter 6. You know the story. In those days, as the number of disciples were multiplying, from Acts 6 verse 1, there arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of bread. Then the twelve summoned the whole company of the disciples and said, It would not be right for us to give up preaching about God to handle financial matters. Therefore, brothers, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the preaching ministry. The proposal pleased the whole company, so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte from Antioch. And they had them stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the preaching about God flourished. The number of the disciples in Jerusalem multiplied greatly, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. Uh, what, click, uh, thanks. what was Stephen's calling? Now, I, I, I would like a really clear sense of calling in my life. Right now, I have to go based on what I know the world to be like and what I know God's word to say. I, I would really like a more specific location for, for our long-term ministry as doors have closed for us. What was, what was Stephen's calling? What's your calling? I'm sure everyone here, by virtue of you being here, know to some extent God's call in your life. Stephen's calling seems to me was he was appointed to oversee the distribution of bread to widows. Uh, that was no small task. Uh, he was stood up before the twelve apostles, the ones that hung around with Jesus, and prayed over and laid hands on and appointed for this task. If that was me, I would consider myself called to that role. Not only that, it implies, as a result of this strategy, preaching about God flourished. The number of the disciples in Jerusalem multiplied greatly, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. His local, his local uh, sphere revival started happening. Stuff was going on in Jerusalem. This was fantastic. A great initiative. Who knew that giving Stephen and the gang bread distribution would so free up the apostles to do this? And we, we can assume then that devoting themselves to prayer and preaching was the reserved role of the apostles and not the primary function of Stephen. I imagine him almost like, you know, going around throwing his newspapers at, on the, like the kid in the movies, cycling with his paper around to get home to the next thing, you know. He sensed that he wasn't just about distributing bread to widows. He wasn't just about his role. And this is what I'm getting at uh, here. A bit like John Gibson Payton. So verse 8. Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. That, not in the job description, unless he was, you know, feeding the 5,000. Uh, that wasn't <laughs> in, his, in, his, in his called role. Um, and then, and then you know the story. It goes on, and he gives this wonderful account before the Sanhedrin of, of the case for Jesus, the Messiah. Uh, and it ends up with him being stoned, face shining like an angel. The dispersion of the apostles. Another, another one of the, uh, of the seven. Philip turns up. He's teleported all across the Middle East, and <laughs> and he uh, and he he opens up the church, as far as we know, in, in East Africa, uh, with the Ethiopian eunuch. It wasn't his job description, it wasn't his calling. He was called to, to local ministry. Uh, now, in the next one. The question is, what else? Uh, Stephen, Philip, Paul, their, their appetite 
outreach their sense of calling. He wanted to go in to Asia Minor. The spirit wouldn't let him. It, it, their appetite exceeded. John Gibson Payton's appetite to see nations come to know Jesus exceeded what he could accomplish in Mary Hill. So this is it. This is I mean this is always challenge for you as you as you are engaged in and will be in future engaged in local congregations. How far does your appetite reach outside of your immediate sphere of influence? We we serve a global God who desires all nations to come to himself. We, the best equipped generation materially, are in a wonderful place to be used by God. How far does your appetite stretch? This is, and so the question I kind of want to leave, uh, what can you do to give God the most glory out of your time on earth? This is an, a, an inquirer, a student in Glasgow University, <laughs> asked me this and I thought it was great. Perfect. Well, well, what can you do to give God the most glory out of your time on earth? Because he gets glory from us. He, he is exalted, not he, he will be. He is high and lifted up. Be still and know that I am Lord. Lord. He, he is there. What, what, what can we do to give him more with the decisions that we make because we thank God that he's given us an invitation but also the, the ability to make decisions based on the state of the world based on the truth of the scripture uh, yeah and that's really it I, I'd like to just leave us with that it's, it's a challenge that that's real for for me in this role and I hope it's real for you too in, in, your, in your teaching positions and your congregations uh, now or in future uh, like, can I pray for you? Father, we thank you, Lord, for your, uh, the fact that you are on the throne, you are seated, Lord Jesus, uh, and that you have declared it finished. Uh, thank you, Lord, that you not only died for us in our sin, uh, but you, you raised us with you, uh, seated, you, seated us with you in the heavenly places, so we can see your goodness laid out in grace to the world be participants in that. Lord, thank you, Lord, that you invite us to participate. Thank you, Lord, for all of which you've blessed us with. Thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us to be a blessing, that we can be your agents of blessing to a world that is in chaos, eh, crying out for truth and for peace with you. Thank you, Lord, that you can use us. Father, I pray your blessing eh, and, and your, your sense, clear sense of calling on the lives of everyone here for each of us, that we would know what it is that you are calling us to, but you would give us a, a desire, a zeal eh, to do more and to do else, to do what else for you. I ask this in Jesus' name, with your servant. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pete, for sharing that with us this morning. On your seats, sorry, those who are videoing and you didn't get one on your seat this morning, <laughs> there are some um, postcards with different chairs on and the comment, don't just sit there, get involved. And there's a Facebook page which is World Mission Advisor Group for UCCF Scotland. That's a mouthful. I'll read it again if you want to take notes of that. A Facebook page, World Mission Advisor Group for UCCF Scotland. And all our short-term opportunities are posted on that Facebook page, so it makes it one place for you to go and look for all the different events but we've got short-term board at the back of the hall this morning and you can look at some of the opportunities there there's literature on the table with the different agencies and also long-term opportunities and the kind of things that we're looking for for people who have qualifications and how their qualifications can fit in into the world of mission because god doesn't just ask you sometimes to give up everything but to take what you already have with you and use that in missions as well and so you don't have to think, well, if I go into missions, all my past has to be put aside. No, you can take your gifts with you and use them in missions if that's what the Lord's asking you to do. So look at the opportunities on the board there. But the, um, the postcard is there to remind you of the Facebook page of uh, the opportunities because perhaps you, you're not ready to think through today and then tomorrow you're thinking, miss that opportunity. It's on the Facebook page for you to go back to. But we're going to be around at the end to chat as well, so please make the most of the opportunity that we, we have. And it doesn't matter if you've got one particular agency in mind, we won't all try and jump on you. 
Um, we, we are happy for you to talk to any one of us um, because we're not competing. We want to see you in the right place because we don't want to send you to the wrong nation if God's got you somewhere else. And so we have a trust relationship as a team that if one person goes with one agency, that's fine um, because we just want to see them in the right place, doing the right work that the Lord's prepared in advance of them to do. Um, there at the back as well are laptops to sign up if you want further information from any particular agency or if you're interested in something like teaching missionaries children or um, doing some kind of student outreach then you can put those details in and then those of us within agencies who have those kind of opportunities will email you back and uh, give you further information on those types of interest or if you want to be a visiting lecturer to, to an establishment somewhere and put that on your CV, well maybe you want to put that on the, the laptop and say, I've got all this time in the summer and other universities around the world are still in classes. I could give some time to do that. So maybe that could be a possibility. Or you might just want to see what it's like to do a church plant somewhere because your church is trying to reach out into a community and you're at a loss as to how best to engage with a community that's totally switched off to the gospel. Go and see a church plant somewhere and then bring back some ideas that might be transferably useful in your context too. So the options are many and vast and we haven't got time to tell you any more, but we do have information that you can take away, pray over and see how the Lord might lead you into this whole world of mission. So the boards are at the back, the Facebook page, you've got a postcard to take away, we can send you a postcard if you email us your address. We'll send you a postcard out. There you go. You're not going to be hard done by. Um, <laughs> and make the most of the opportunity to talk to us as well. We're going to close with um, the song King of Kings, Majesty. Because no matter who's on uh, the throne locally, there is one who reigns over all. And we're going to worship him as we close. <clears throat> thank you and praise you that you reign and rule over all the earth. We thank you that you have a heart for the peoples of this world and we thank you that you have placed us in this generation for your purposes and for your glory. We just ask Lord that we would be obedient to your prompting, obedient to your call on our lives, that we would gladly do the work that you have prepared in advance for us to do. May we who have been entrusted with much be responsible before you 
with the lives that you've given to us to serve you faithfully, wherever that may be, whether here locally or further afield. We do pray, Lord, that as you equip us, that we would use our gifts that you have given to us for your purposes, for your glory, that the nations of the earth would rejoice with us in the God of our salvation. And we ask then, Father, until you call us to yourself or come again, that, Father, that you would use us for your purpose, for your glory, and that uh, your blessing would remain upon us now and always. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 See you folks, sorry we can't send you lunch. Cheers, Michael. Take care, man. See you, Chris. I can't see this. He's looking at the top of it.